All right, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, and today we're going to venture into the exciting world of entity formation and selection. Thank you for joining me today. So, as we move through this, I'm going to give you an overview of what we're going to do. We'll start with my background. We'll go into, and then we'll also talk about your background as well. Um, we'll try and get a sense for who the audience is, a show of hands for where you are in, in your journey, and we'll uh, you know, try and tailor the presentation to that. We'll talk about the initial ownership structure. We'll talk about some common issues that come up when you are a founder and you're starting to start up. And we'll touch a little bit on intellectual property, which will be a good segue for Mark, who's going to speak after me. Mark and I don't work together, but we've worked on a few projects and have shared some clients together in the past. All right, so I've been practicing law since 2005. My firm focuses on the corporate needs of emerging growth companies and other startups. Uh, we are a corporate boutique law firm. So we do any formation, financings. You know, we've heard of Series C, convertible debt, Series A. Uh, we also handle mergers and acquisitions. And uh, we also serve as general outside counsel for uh, a number of, of tech companies in the area, and also some non-tech companies, too. Before I started my practice, I was a litigator at uh, Wilson Sonsini, which is a big firm locally. If you guys are in this space, you've probably heard of them. Uh, I am licensed in California, the District of Columbia, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, but I only practice here in uh, California. And a fun fact is that I've made over 1,000 skydives, and I'm a competitive skydiver. So let's talk about your background. Who here is in a startup? Raise your hand. OK, good. We've got some entrepreneurs here. Who here is a founder? And who, who is this? Who's got their first startup? OK, good. This will be kind of geared towards you all. Who of you have had an exit before? Who's had a, was it a successful exit? That's good. Anyone with an unsuccessful exit? That's good, too. You've, I'm sure you've learned a lot. Um, who here is interested in entity formation? All right, sweet. OK, well, I was talking to some of you earlier, and it seemed like most of you guys were focused on the IP and the patent stuff, so I, I was going to feel a little lonely. Um, and you know, in terms of general corporate issues, can you guys shout out maybe a couple of things that you're interested in hearing about? Delaware C Corps, LLCs, why you choose between the you know, one over the other. That sound good? And we're going to move through that stuff today. So you come to the right place. Types of, uh, types of founder, stock, you know, uh, different classes. I don't know if you covered that. Uh, I believe we'll probably touch on some of that. And I'll try to keep it in the back of my mind to, to hit on it when we're talking about things that are related to it. OK. So we, yeah, we will be talking about some of that stuff today. And we are time limited, so we'll try and at least touch on it. So uh, let me start you off with the most exciting part, which is the warnings, right? Today's discussion is general information and is not legal advice. Okay, That means not only what I'm discussing here, but if we have a conversation before or after. Okay, that's, you know, We'll talk about rules. We'll talk about exceptions to the rules. We'll talk about the facts that are going on. But we're not going to have enough time to know all the facts in order to give you a good answer, give you good legal advice. So you know, in order for you to get legal advice, you need to retain uh, specific counsel, legal counsel who's competent in that area. Um, our off-the-cuff answers are not going to be legal advice. But you can talk to us later, or you, and you can set up a time to talk. And we can continue our discussion and see whether or not we'd be a good fit. Um, whether or not we can get to a place where we could give you some advice. So let's take and think about the big picture here with this terrible slide that I created. OK, so what you have going on here is you got the company, and that's down in the bottom box. And the sort of whole goal between, uh, behind startups and emerging growth companies is to grow a business um, that's going to take advantage in, in either new markets, create a new market, or refine or exploit you know, a market that maybe needs to, that is ripe for exploitation, right? So for example, you can think of like Uber, right? There were definitely people running around providing rides to other people, okay? But those were called taxi cabs. It was a highly regulated industry. Um, as, as a re 
as a uh, result of that, there were sort of exorbitant profits to the, to the medallion owners of the cabs. And it was ripe maybe for someone else to come in and start connecting people. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, attacking or creating a new, excuse me, refining a market versus, you know, creating a new market, like maybe what Friendster did. And they did it, but they weren't necessarily the best at doing the social networking thing. So, you know, Facebook came along better later and did a better job. Anyway, the point is, you need to get a lot of stuff into this company in order for it to grow and scale and be able to take advantage of, of these uh, areas in the market or the new market, okay? So you gotta get capital in there. That's where your investors come in, okay? You gotta get your ideas in there. Maybe that's just sort of a whiteboard drawing that you initially sort of start with, but those are your intangible assets. So you gotta get that plugged in and connected to the company. And then you gotta get the people who are gonna execute. Okay, those are the people who are going to take those ideas. They're going to refine them into something that's an executable form, right? I.e., maybe developing the app or, uh, or developing the piece of hardware. And you need to make sure that all of those inputs are getting put into the company. And the reason for that is that that's where the value is supposed to reside. When an investor invests in your company, they want to make sure that they're getting a piece of not only the IP, but also um, you know, the folks who are involved that have created it and that will continue to grow and scale that company. That's where the value is. So what do we do and what do we think about in any formation is making sure that you're getting all of those inputs connected through a chain of title, i.e. paperwork, into the company. Does this make sense to people? All right. Let's roll on. So let's start maybe by talking about what your choices are. And one of the things I like to do always is start with the default choice, right, which is no entity. OK, that's just basically you working on your project by yourself, maybe with somebody else. And let's talk about what some of the pitfalls are there. OK, one, on the upside, it's pretty cheap. right? You don't need to pay you know, a lawyer to, to form yourself. You were born however many years ago that you were born. You know, maybe you file a DBA, you know, doing business as, which you guys have probably heard about. Um, but there's just not a lot of expenses. Downside of that is that there's no shield against uh, personal liability. So issues that you create, you will be personally liable for. What does that mean? Well, let's say you've got, and I heard somebody talking about they have a, a company that does augmented reality, AR, right? You create that game, you put it out there, you don't put enough warnings on it or whatever, and the kid steps into the middle of traffic, it gets hit by a bus. Your personal assets are on the line. That's your house, your car, anything else. And just because you don't have any assets doesn't mean that you're not going to potentially be in a predicament. The reason for that is that if they get a judgment against you, that can last at least 10 years or maybe longer. So even if you don't have assets today, maybe you'll have money in the future which can get attached and can taken from you. Um, pro tip. Uh, for, for the rest of our presentation, if you guys could either silence or just turn off your cell phones, that's cool. Um, I'm guilty of that sin as well. So uh, another downside is that there is no ability to grant or transfer equity interests in yourself. What does that mean? The business is you. You can't give somebody a piece of you. Okay, maybe you could do some sort of rev share arrangement or something, but you know that doesn't give them the same rights and opportunities that they would have if they had a um, interest in, in a corporation. Let's say another downside is accidental partnerships. Okay, that means, let's say it's not just you, it's me and Mark Koo and we're working on something together. Well, all of a sudden we might be considered partners. Um, the issue with that is maybe that means even though we would think that we had a sort of 80-20 relationship, as I like to kind of stand on Mark's shoulders, um, you know, under the eyes of the law it would be a 50-50 relationship. Uh, some of the other issues are that you can be personally liable for things that your partners says and does and, and obligations that he, he or she undertakes in the name of the business. So what does that mean? That means Mark goes out and leases a Ferrari for the company but doesn't pay. I'm going to have to pay for his lease. I mean, no one's actually going to lease a Ferrari. Well, maybe. I was going to say no one's going to lease a Ferrari, but it's possible. So really in startups, no entity is not a good choice to have. There are some limited circumstances where maybe it's appropriate. Maybe if it's just you and you're just doing a doodle on a whiteboard, you know, that could very well be premature to form, you know, spending the money incorporating. But um, generally, once you start to get other people involved, that's when you should be thinking about 
starting a company. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what's another option? Well, lots of people, especially folks who are doing it on their own, think about limited liability companies. And they say to themselves, this is wonderful. I've been done a lot of research online. There are like wonderful things like no double taxation. Show of hands for who knows what double taxation is. OK, that's right. That's when the company gets taxed at one level, and then as the owner, you get taxed at the second. Um, so people are really kind of motivated by that. They think, well, limited liability, I get the, I get the protection of, of the liability shield of that LLC. And that's true if you maintain the um, if you maintain the corporate books and records that are associated with the LLC. But there are some downsides, OK? It's not as attractive to venture capital investors. OK, one of the reasons for that is that that same thing that you like, the no double taxation, i.e., a pass-through entity, um, those profits and losses would get passed on to the, the limited partnerships that would be investing in your company, that is, the venture funds that are investing in your company. And they don't want to have to then turn around and pass those profits and losses on to their investors. So, that's why it's typically not attractive, um, typically why we end up with a C-Corp, which is why we'll talk about what we'll talk about in a moment. Um, you know, some of the other issues that go with that is sometimes it's harder to acquire equity, <clears throat> harder to use equity to acquire other businesses. What LLCs really are, they're a hybrid between uh, corporations and partnerships. So they're really sort of set up to be more like a partnership. That is, there are no set rules you need to come up and you need to get that all together in an agreement. In an LLC, it's called an operating agreement. And um, as a consequence of that, you know, not only do, uh, as a consequence of that, the members, who would otherwise be the partners in a partnership, you know, generally have um, ownership and control and other things, as well as, um, the taxes and you know the gains and losses passed on to them. So it's harder to use that to acquire other businesses. It's also more difficult for those exact same reasons to reward employees with equity, which is one of the things here in the Valley that you know folks look to do, right? You may not necessarily get paid the highest salary ever, but you're getting equity in the company, and that is of value. So that brings us to those are kind of what the other options are. So we'll go with the one, we'll talk about the one that is sort of more, most common or that is um, what we typically go with. So usually we're looking at a corporation. Um, some of the plus sides, you get that limited liability. Uh, a plus side, especially since, you, you know, presumably for startups and emerging growth companies, you're looking for a venture, venture capital investment. This is taxed as a separate tax entity. Um, it also has a, a developed man management structure. Okay, what does that mean? Well, who here has heard of a board of directors? OK, you get that automatically with a corporation. I mean, that's how corporations are operated. There are some exceptions to that, but that is, that is the stock way to do it. And that makes sense. Why? Because your investors are, among other things, potentially going to seek a seat or two on the board. They want to have input and control over, or at least input and influence over how their, their investment is going to be made. Uh, again, unlike the LLC, it's also sort of easier to grant e uh, equity here um, and to use equity to motivate employees. So that's one of the reasons why folks see this. In terms of jurisdiction, we usually set up Delaware. Um, there are a few reasons for that, OK? Um, I was trying to think of a funny one, but it just fled my mind. It'll come back to me in a second. But on the, on the more serious side of things, um, most corporations in terms of states, Delaware has more corporations uh, set up there than any other state. They have a very robust, um, one, corporate code, two, a uh, body of case law dealing with corporate issues. That's called the Delaware Chancery. Um, three, within their corporate code, they, ju they generally provide more protection for directors and officers. And one of the reasons why that's important is that those investors who are going to be putting money into your company are going to want a seat as a director on the board, OK? And they're going to want to have the liability shield that goes with being in Delaware. It's not always true. I've actually worked you know, in my former life. I did securities litigation. And you know, there can be some times when California actually would have had a little bit more protection. Um, but it's as a general rule, it's generally safer. Kind of like, and you know, everyone sort of hears the lawyers talking, well, it could be this way, it could be that way. 
it's kind of like wearing your seatbelt, okay? Usually it's better to be in your car and wearing your seatbelt, but there can be exceptions to that. I mean, heaven forbid you get in an accident and you end up upside down underwater in a ditch and you're knocked unconscious, maybe it would have been better to have been thrown by the car you know, as you were starting to roll over. But you know, generally speaking, it's statistically safer to be uh, wearing your seatbelt, and that's why we do it. Now, everyone says, I also have here, beware of section 115, excuse me, 2115, and that is the California Corporations Code 2115. It is the pseudo-foreign corporation uh, section of the statute, which basically says, you know, if you have enough assets and enough people based here in California, we don't care about what Delaware says about how the company is supposed to be run and, and uh, you know, which liabilities apply. So you're gonna still have to follow our law. So that's one thing you have to be a little careful of. Um, you know, the really interesting thing is there are some constitutional arguments why that shouldn't be upheld, but nobody wants to go all the way through and fight it, so it's just something to be aware of. So let's talk about some of the mechanics of what it takes to start a corporation. Um, name selection, all right? Kind of starts with that. There are some issues, right? So Mark is probably gonna talk a bit about uh, trademarks later. But aside from just having a trademark, which is you know, the right to use uh, the name associated with providing a good or service in the market, um, there is the name that gets set aside with the Secretary of State of each of the states in which you're doing business, okay? Kind of like making sure you have the right, light, like making sure you can get a specific license plate you know, it's either you can't have it or you can't have it. So you need to reserve those names in, you know, in the jurisdictions in which you'll be doing business because otherwise, you know, you set up as Apple. Okay, maybe Apple is available in Wyoming, but you come out here in California and you're gonna have to come up with a different name for your company to do business out here. Um, again, it's a little bit different than trademark rights, so even if you could set up your company in Apple and make computers in, as Apple in, in Wyoming, okay, well, Apple's gonna have trademark rights over that name, so these two things kind of interlock. It's kind of helpful to think about it that way. So in terms of the mechanics of actually getting, um, actually getting together and getting the, the corporation formed, you gotta file the certificate of incorporation. So that's basically the document that goes on file with the Secretary of State in the, in the uh, jurisdiction in which you're forming a company. And it's gonna contain a number of things. I'm just looking at my slides to see if I have. Okay, it's gonna contain the name. It's gonna ta contain the number of authorized shares. Okay, that's the, that's the top level number of what you're allowed to issue. It's generally common stock. Um, for, for these kinds of companies, it's usually either 10 million or 20 million shares. Um, you could have what's called blank check preferred, which would allow the board to uh, grant preferred uh, or approve preferred when, um, if and when you get to venture fin financing, but that also doesn't necessarily need to be in there right away. You'll see other things like, you know, where your agent for service of process is, where your registered office is. Those are basically mechanisms so that either the state or somebody who wants to sue your company for something can get in touch and make sure that the paperwork goes through correctly. And then, of course, it'll be signed by the incorporator. That's the person who's actually creating the corporation. So uh, I believe we're gonna talk about some of those items, including shares, as we kind of continue to move through the formation process. So <clears throat> for, the, for the purposes of this discussion, we'll be talking about uh, for, forming with the Delaware Secretary of State, because that's typically what's done, but it's not always right in all circumstances, so don't just go out and do that by, after listening to this. Um, so you're not done, okay? You know, if you're doing business out here, if, if, you know, if you're based here, you're gonna need to register with the, the state of California and potentially the local authorities. So what does that mean? Well, California Secretary of State will require you to qualify as a foreign corporation doing business out here. You basically <coughs> have to submit a certificate of good standing pay um, you know, pay a filing fee, and then you're gonna be needing to pay taxes out here too. Uh, local authorities, don't forget, you probably need to get a business license and you know, file with the county where you're at. There'll be incorporator actions, okay, what will that do? Well, you have to think about a corporation as sort of a separate person. 
And you know, the only way that that person can act is through, through the people that work for it. But those actions need to be documented in writing. So in order to set that up, you, know, you need to um, appoint the directors. You know, you'll need to issue shares of stock to the initial shareholders. You'll need to appoint the executives, which are sort of, those are the folks who will be carrying out the, the orders of the directors. And if we could just kind of take a step back and further like complete this analogy of a personification of a corporation. You could sort of think of it as a person, okay, where the board of directors is the brain and they make the decisions, setting sort of the long-term agenda of the company. And the um, executives, you know, president, CEO, uh, secretary, treasurer, CFO, it's their job to carry out those, those decisions by the board of directors. And in terms of, in, in terms of ownership status, it's the shareholders that own the company, right? And so they have, uh, they have the right to vote to elect the board of directors, and they also have the right to, um, you know, they have the right to dividends when they're declared appropriately. They also have the right to veto certain other things, but we don't have to get at that, and we don't have to talk about that today. So let's talk about founders agreements, right? So founders agreements are gonna go along with uh, the initial issuance of shares. And what's the purpose behind them? Well, the purpose behind them is to make sure that if Mark, my co-founder in this hypothetical, leaves, he doesn't take you know, 50% of, of the equity in the company and I'm still left there working and trying to run it. So who here has heard of vesting? That's why those founders agreements are going to contain vesting provisions. So that, you know, so long as your co-founder is there and putting in the time, and you are there and putting in the time, you're continuing to build equity in the company. But if you leave, you don't take all of that. The company has the right to retrieve the parts that you haven't yet earned. Does this make sense? Uh, IP assignments. If you can kind of mentally think back to my uh, picture earlier, it's about getting those inputs, getting title into the, into the organization. And so you want to make sure you have IP assignments so that your co-founder, <coughs> even though you've been working on it together for before you incorporated, if he or she were to leave, you know, they're not going to have the right to claim some of the portion of the IP. And why is that important? Because your investors, because the potential acquirers down the road are going to want to be able to make sure that you know, the car that they're buying has all of its parts. Somebody hasn't walked off with the starter, for example. Um, securities filings. So securities filings are very important whenever, and even if you're a small company, whenever you're issuing any securities, whether they are equity, like common stock or preferred, or debt, like, um, you know, promissory notes, or convertible debt, which is kind of a little bit in between the two, um, you need to make sure that you're complying with the securities laws. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to go out and register with the SEC and, and declare an IPO right away, but it means that you need to make sure that you're targeting the right kind of exemption so that you can be in compliance with those laws. So, um, you know, typically for founders, it, it's going to be a 25102F filing here in the state of California. And under the 33 Act, it's going to be uh, fall under Section 4A2, it's a private offering. But, but not always. I mean, and there's some things that you have to take a look at, especially um, you know, if it's going to be a passive founder, if they're not going to be somebody who's, who's uh, engaged in the business. Uh, We're going to hold all questions to the end, if you don't mind. No um, but I'd be happy to take it at the end. Um, and then making sure you filed your 83B election is very critical. There's a 30-day window to do that. Who here, show of hands, knows what a 83B election is? All right, so we got one person. Let me, let me tell you what it is, because it's a critical thing and it gets missed, and even some big companies have messed up you know, very early on. So let's go back to that concept of vesting, okay? Um, most people think of it as getting shares of stock over time, and that's a helpful way to think about it, but really the way the IRS generally thinks about it is it's like you get all of your shares, and this is true also in the agreements, you get all of your shares up front. And as time goes by, let me take a step back. 
You get all of your shares up front, but there are strings attached to those shares. Okay, so think about you know a pile of shares here with a string, pile of shares here with a string, pile of shares here with a string. Over time, when you've earned it and put in that time, a string gets cut. A string gets cut. So that if you walk away, you can gather the stuff that has had the string cut, but the stuff that has the string there is still the same. Um, I think that's a helpful analogy. So basically, the IRS takes the position that you know, if, if, the, if you are given stock and there's a substantial uh, risk of forfeiture of that stock, okay, you don't actually receive the stock until the string is cut. Okay? And the problem here is when you receive the, you know, you've paid early on very little for the stock. You've paid basically far, par value because the star, stock is exceedingly hard to value and maybe arguably worthless initially until you've actually built the thing out. So early on, you know, you've paid the 0.001 cents a share, and, um, and that's fine and appropriate. But over time, your company is growing. Let's say you get, you know, you build it out. You got 10 employees. You now have 20 employees. You get a valuation. The company is now worth $10 million. It's now worth $20 million. As those strings are being cut, the value of that stock is no longer 0 0.001 of a penny. It's a dollar a share. It's $2 a share. And you're going to be taxed on the spread between what you paid and what it's now worth. Um, so 83B election is the mechanism behind it. It allows you to prepay the tax that you would need to pay on that stock. So when you first get it, even with all the strings, you prepay the tax on it. And then you don't have to pay the tax when it gets cut, when those strings are cut. Now, the downside to that is that you've prepaid it. You can't get it back generally. The upside is that. If your startup is successful, um, you're not going to end up with a huge tax bill. <coughs> All right. Um, so some of the other things that we'll talk about is the initial ownership um, and who gets what and what happens if somebody leaves. And uh, actually, we've already covered that, which is good. Uh, in terms of the, the splits and the equities, um, you know, one of the things is that there's no set really way to do it. There's some online calculators, and if you sort of Google that, you can, you can use them. I'm not necessarily recommending them. You know, we generally sort of see that the person who's putting in the biggest effort, putting in the most money, um, they're the folks who get the most equity. What happens if somebody leaves? All right, as I said, we have these founders agreements in place. Um, typically, they'll cover sort of a, uh, a four-year vesting period with a one-year cliff. Um, they could, there can be sometimes uh, acceleration in there. Uh, acceleration is basically the concept that if you get terminated, and there are some different ways to handle it, um, all those strings would get cut at once. This under certain circumstances. There are other. <laughs> Other rights in there that sometimes that go in there in terms of rights of first refusal and co-sale uh, rights and also drag along rights, which basically go to if a founder wants to sell his or her stock, you want to make sure you don't, it doesn't end up in the hands of the wrong person. You don't want it to go, you know, if you're setting up the next, uh, you know, internet search engine, you don't want your co-founder to be able to sell his, his or her shares to Google. Um, and I think that covers all of the issues that I had. I have additional things in here relating to financings and, and also some employment issues. But I'm getting the, the signal that it's time to move on. So were there any quick questions before I end? Sure. Um, the two questions that I had is, what are the, just in like one sentence or whatever, what's the difference between an S corp and an LLC? And then secondly, one that I actually care more about, I understand that like um, the founders agreements would define vesting. Yeah. But that generally requires that you like are materially like contributing to the company or something. But how do you define like that contribution? Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So first question, difference between an S Corp and an LLC. Uh, well, in terms of what they are, it is it's there's pretty easy difference. So yeah. So one is a corporation and then the other is an LLC. So a corporation has shareholders, it has a board of directors, it has executives. Um, there is the corporate code which governs how interactions are to happen, i.e., 
you know, what kind of vote the shareholders are going to get, what kind of vote the directors get to get, those types of things, how, how the, election, how the um, directors get elected, um, versus an LLC, which is, you know, there is now a revised um, LLC Act that covers some things, but by and large, it's a matter of contract. So you have to build out your, all of your mechanism in an operating agreement. The more sophisticated, and to drill down just a little bit more on your question, and I'm not a tax lawyer, um, the more interesting question sort of is, what would be some of the tax advantages between an S Corp and an LLC? Because each of those is a pass-through entity. So in that respect, they're pretty similar, but you're going to have to talk to a sophisticated CPA or a tax lawyer to really be able to answer that question, whether or not it would make sense for you. There are certain things that come up, like 1202 stock, which is qualified small business stock, which allows you to sometimes write off, or not write off, but um, I don't, I'm not going to use the right term, but you don't necessarily, yeah, yeah, and, cap, and, and some capital, you get to exclude, that's the, I think the word I was looking for, you get to exclude a certain amount of gains if you like have held the stock for long enough and, um, you know, if, you know, but it was, you know, basically if you've held the stock for long enough that I don't think, but you'd have to double check, don't think you get with an LLC. So, you know, kind of at the margins, some of these things would actually come up and make a difference. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And then in terms of uh, co-founder agreements and vesting, we usually tie them to time because effort is pretty hard to tell, and that's kind of the issue. I mean, people will want to negotiate in materiality or putting in an X number of um, hours a week or those types of things, and that can be kind of hard to tell. It's kind of like you know the slogan, you manage what you measure. Or, you know, especially like if you're a startup and you know, one person's working on nights and the other person's working on different nights and you're not necessarily sitting there and collaborating together. So that's how we typically handle it um, and kind of move away from either metrics like performance, you know, this is for founders, moving away from performance metrics or trying to um, put these qualifications in there because they're just ripe for dispute later. And even, I mean, when a founder leaves, if it's not of their own volition, it's not fun. And it's not a good situation. So does that answer your question, too? So you're saying you generally do something that can easily be quantified by time? Yeah, just the fact that they're still working, which puts the burden on the company to, you know, puts a burden on the other folks who are involved to, you know, provide that notice, to, to sever that <clears throat> relationship appropriately, right, within whatever the contractual agreements are. But, you know, that way it's true. Otherwise, you know, they don't need to be doing anything, and time will continue to tick by. So... I actually have probably three more minutes if anybody else has any questions. Kathy? Um, well, my question is about the co-founder agreement again. Yep. Um, I am going to um, get started with a startup, and for that matter, I mm -hmm. need a co-founder. Right. That co-founder will be the CTO. Mm -hmm. So um, most likely, he will have all the IP and intellectual property and everything in his brain right. here. So, if he wants to leave after a while, let's say in, in, in a year or two for any reason, for any matter, yeah. uh, it will not just be enough for me to just um, cut him from the yeah. shares of the company. Yeah. There'll be more. So is there any um, possibility to have uh, the co-founder penalized for um, early departure or have them committed into staying in the partnership for a while? Um, so usually that gets handled in, well, there are a few ways to handle this. Sort of a typical way is to have a, an agreement in place with each of the founders, uh, which would, and also to that extent, other employees or other consultants, which would be the confidential information and intellectual property assignment agreement. So that all of the IP is getting titled to the company, and within that there can be um, acknowledgments that you know all that stuff that's in his head is actually the company's, and so he would not be able to use it elsewhere if he exited and, and wanted to go elsewhere. In terms of, um, and and he could be penalized and subject to breach of contract and other legal claims if he started to use it elsewhere. Um, from a more practical, well, not necessarily more practical, but from a from an operational perspective. You also need to be making sure that all that data is not just residing in, in his or her brain, that it's actually making its way physically over to you know, either the servers of the company or, or wherever else so that you could bring somebody else in and they could basically pick up where that person had left off. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, yes, it does. Do we have um, one more minute sure. for another question? Or? If I tell you what, why don't we chat? OK, OK. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, all right. So the other question is, uh, well, and you mentioned uh, everything about uh, drag along and all these yeah, um, sure. matters. But my question is, what if, God forbid, the other uh, person, the co-founder, just uh, passes away, or mm -hmm. they are in a divorce situation, or something like that? Yeah. What will happen in that case? Uh, will the spouse just, or other family members, um, automatically inherit all those uh, shares, which is not the best scenario, or are there some other precautionary matters? Yeah, so I mean, typically how that is handled that, you know, in the event they want to, you know, they pass away or, um, or they want to title it and move the ownership over to the trust. I mean, typically that's, that's okay and permissible. Um, sometimes, you know, you'll need to have a spouse sp sign an agreement acknowledging that you know they that the spouse would also be you know locked up, it, not the not the spouse locked up, but the shares of the spouse would be locked up or unable to be transferred to anybody else after that. So they would still be bound by that shareholder they agreement. Have voting rights. They would they would have voting rights, yeah. Unless unless it's handled that there would be some sort of buyback provision. But the issue is especially when you're just starting off is then how is that valued, okay, um, and. And that's sort of the tricky thing, you know. They may, you know, they may pass away a week before, you know, the first round or whatever, where the company gets valued at whatever. And that's that's maybe a little bit easier because then at least you have an objective valuation. Um, but you know, if it's after a down round or before, you know, substantially before, that's kind of hard to tell too. Okay. Well, I'm free to chat afterwards, and then I'm just going to set this up for Rob. Uh,